Okay, uh, welcome everybody to this week's uh, Miami Global Brain Tumor Symposium. Uh, it's an honor to be here uh, today with all of my great panelists and speaker. Uh, my name is Michael Ivan. I'm one of the brain tumor and skull-based surgeons here at the University of Miami, and I lead our research program in brain tumors. And I'm joined by my co-directors, Dr. Morcos, who's the professor and, and co-chairman of our neurosurgery department here at the University of Miami. He's also a director of cerebrovascular and skull-based program. Uh, also, Dr. Komatar, who is a professor of neurosurgery and our residency program director. He's also a director of the UMBTI in surgical neuro-oncology. And uh, Dr. Benjamin, assistant professor, skull base and, and brain tumor specialist, who's director of our skull base uh, uh, dissection laboratory. Each week we put on these, I think this is session number 21 uh, and uh, throughout COVID, and, and we can't do this without the great help of all of our administrators for, and support from the Cancer Center, from the University of Miami, and from the Neurosurgery Department. So thank you, Christina, Ingrid, Roberto, and Ignacio for all of your help behind the scenes uh, and everything that you do. If anybody has any questions about uh, our program or University of Miami, uh, we're very active on social media and uh, also on Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook. Uh, here are some of the ways you could find us. A uh, reminder that all of our um, videos are, are recorded and you could find them if you miss them or have to leave early on our YouTube channel, which is uh, at the University of Miami Neurosurgery. Uh, all the symposiums as well as our grand rounds can be found there. Uh, in conjunction with the Brain Tumor Symposium, which happens every Wednesday, uh, on Thursdays, we have a, just an outstanding cerebrovascular and skull base symposium that's led by Dr. Morcos. I'm one of the co-directors as well as some of my partners. And, and tomorrow, there's really an exceptional uh, talk. Uh, it's going to be a little bit later than usual at 7 p.m., but it's worth the wait. Uh, Dr. Hurtis Nami is going to be joining us uh, for uh, talking about his entire career history of aneurysms, which I think is over 10,000, uh, and it'll be translated by Dr. Zhu. So please be sure to tune in tomorrow night, which is sure to be a memorable talk. Also, uh, a teaser for next week, next Wednesday here uh, at 5 o'clock, we'll be welcoming a, another a, a amazing speaker, Dr. Stuck, will be joining us from Northwestern uh, to talk about new and not so new trends in clinical glioma research. Uh, always, always a pleasure to hear from Dr. Stuck talk about uh, his thoughts on what's going on in such a difficult field as glioblastoma. So please be sure to join us next Wednesday. Uh, a little housekeeping participants, please be sure uh, to ask questions. We try to make this as interactive as possible. We'll, we'll talk to Dr. Lee throughout the talk and afterwards and try to uh, get to everybody's questions. The best way is to use the Q&A button or the chat button. We don't offer CME for these talks, but you will get an email confirmation documenting participation. And please be sure to like, follow, and share our videos on our uh, social media websites so we can continue to grow and spread the word of all the great knowledge from our speakers tonight. So this week, uh, we have a great list of panelists, uh, starting with Dr. Jones. Uh, she's a neurosurgeon and neurosurgical oncologist at Harvard Medical School and Massachusetts General Hospital, uh, assistant professor of neurosurgery and expert in, in brain tumors. We have Dr. Evans, who is assistant professor uh, and brain tumor expert, joining us from Dartmouth and also one of the leaders in 5ALA. And Dr. D'Amico, who's director of neurosurgery services at Wyckoff uh, Heights Medical Center and uh, part of their department of neurosurgery, on the famous Lenox Hill uh, program. Um, tonight, we welcome Dr. Lee. Uh, Dr. Lee is a professor uh, from the University of Pennsylvania. He's a part of their Department of Neurosurgery and the medical director of their gamma knife program, clinical director of their Center for Precision Surgery, and also the PI for the Lee Visualization Lab. Uh, Dr. Lee, um, although he focuses on brain tumor and skull base, he's really been leading the, the way over the last uh, couple years on, on the use of interoperative uh, visualization techniques. And I think that goes hand in hand with his other um, kind of passion, which is minimally invasive surgery and keyhole surgery uh, with the idea of, of maybe kind of combining the two for improving uh, you know, the ability to see tumor and resect it uh, by minimally invasive techniques. Um, he's, he's really kind of doing something that nobody else is doing. And that's why we invited him here today to talk about really what is the next step in, in tumor visualization uh, during surgery um, uh, in and of itself. So Dr. Lee, thank you so much for taking the time to join with us today, uh, and we look forward to your talk. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ivan, Dr. Marcos, and the whole uh, Miami team. Um, 
it's a real honor to um, uh, step in here and uh, present uh, some of my work uh, that I've been doing for the last five years now. And um, I, um, I believe that if we surgeons can see it, we can operate on it. When we can't see it, we can't operate. So this is the real challenge. Um, how can we see better? And so I'm going to um, turn on my uh, slide here. And um, okay, so what I'm gonna talk about today is the use of near-infrared fluorophores. Feel free to follow me on social media as well at Dr. Lee Brain Surge. So this was the cover of the uh, one year ago, 2019 um, uh, Neurosurgery Journal. And this was a review and written by uh, Dan Zhang, his first author, um, who is an MD-PhD student here at Penn, will be applying hopefully to neurosurgery. Um, but what we talked about was what actually is fluorescence? How does it differ from just visual light and um, uh, 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 what, what, when we just look with our eyes and how is that different than uh, fluorophores where we excite it and then look at a different wavelength and how does that help us to operate? So although my practice actually doesn't really focus on glioblastoma, my research has kind of led me to talk a lot about glioblastoma, uh, which is uh, intriguing because most of my time is spent with skull base. But um, we're talking about uh, GBM today or high-grade gliomas, low-grade gliomas, and these infiltrative margins where we have trouble um, seeing. Um, now, first of all, I think you have to accept um, that there is a role for surgery in glioblastoma surgery or high-grade gliomas. And I think there's been several um, papers, Lacroix's paper and Anderson Eyes and then Stu Stumer's articles um, here, which um, lend credence to the uh, proposition that uh, surgery matters. Um, so if surgery matters, how can we improve that surgery? And we really always credit uh, uh, Professor Stumer for his uh, pioneering work in bringing 5-ALA to the field. Now, I'm not going to talk about 5-ALA much. Uh, I, I know that my panelists will be presenting some cases. But 5-ALA is the current gold standard. It's been used in Europe, it's been used in Asia, and now it's being used in the United States. However, the question I have posed to you is, how does 5-ALA get to the tumor? Um, so these are some papers published by Stumer and colleagues uh, um, years ago, where the primary mode of, um, or at least the hypothesis as how to how 5-ALA actually enters the tumor is essentially broken blood-brain barrier or disrupted blood-brain barrier. There is also some choroid plexus um, uh, entrance as well. Now, recognizing this, um, it, we start to you know question how do any of these fluorophores, how does anything get into the tumor? So a little Let's take gadolinium. This was approved in 1988. It changes the T1 relaxation time. Actually, um, MRI, when they originally only had T1 and T2, the concern was that for meningiomas, you really couldn't see too much. You couldn't find meningiomas that easily without gadolinium. So gadolinium was approved in 1988. It completely um, changes your visualization. Um, it'll, it, it extravasates through the broken blood-brain barrier, and we have um, excellent visualization of our tumor. Here are some just representative tumors that I've uh, tackled. Um, insular gliomas. So here's an occipital lobe glioblastoma. And what I want to show you is one of the challenges of 5-ALA is it's a, excited in the blue. Blue is a very sh um, short wavelength, and consequently, it doesn't penetrate very deeply. Um, so you cannot see through um, tissue. Um, if you have a near-infrared uh, fluorophore, you can see penetrate much deeper, even if it's a little bit redder, even a, a fluorophore that would be excited in the red, and 5-ALA has, or protoporphyrin has some properties where you can do that, and I know that the Dartmouth team has exploited that uh, periodically. But if I could deliver a fluorophore, just let it leak into the tumor, just like uh, gadolinium here, then I could potentially just see that dye even through normal cortex even through normal dura. So what I've, we've been able to do, this is just an ex this particular occipital lobe GBM, the sagittal sinus is covered here. And um, this is the normal cortex. Now, if I can excite that fluorophore at the 800 wavelength, which is, allows me to penetrate up to a, a centimeter deep, and if I can capture that emission also at that one centimeter, I should be able to see that dye. So now I can't see that with my eyes, uh, because we're not able to see at that wavelength um, that we're roughly limited to 400 to 750 with our own uh, eyes. But with a camera, and virtually any camera today can detect near-infrared, um, we should be able to visualize this. So there we go. 
I, if I can just deliver a simple old fashioned 1950s dye um, that extravasates into the tumor, we sh may be able to just see anything that gadolinium enhances. So um, now other reasons that near infrared fluorophores is much more interesting than white light fluorophores is that there is a lot of contamination in the, um, in all of the body tissues in visible light range. So brain has all kinds of, and these are just some of the myriad of contaminants that um, autofluoresce in the visible spectrum. However, as you come out to 800, um, so here you can see uh, what's spanning from 400 to 700. If you come out to 800, you start to um, have virtually clean signal. There is very little autofluorescence in the 800. So that's an advantage. Um, next, protoporphyrin is a very weak dye in terms of um, its quantum efficiency and its brightness. So if you just take your quantum yield, so if I shine 100 photons of light at protoporphyrin, only eight come back uh, with a emission event. And then you combine that with its molar extinction, it's just a very poor, it's just a very dark dye. All of us have experienced this. You give that patient five ALA, you take your microscope. I can't, it's so hard to see. It's just, a, it, it takes a learn, there's a learning curve. Um, and actually, if you just look away from the microscope, or just look with your eyes, you'll actually see more because you don't have to worry about the beam path and light splitting and you're only getting some of the light into your um, uh, observer. So actually, it's much easier. I actually sometimes just take a blue flashlight flat with the screen uh, onto the surface of the brain and just look with my eyes. I can see that, that, that fluorescence better. Um, so uh, you guys can try this. Uh, we're publishing a, a small paper on this, just kind of cheap easy ways to fluoresce a fluorophore in the visible light. Um, now, indocyanine green is 30 times brighter. It's not necessarily more uh, efficient uh, in its quantum yield, but um, it's 30 times brighter. And then fluorescein is really bright. I mean, it's 200 times brighter than protoporphyrin. And actually, sometimes I think it's too bright um, in some respects. So what, am, what properties are we exploiting? So this is something that uh, Maida uh, um, published uh, years ago. Uh, it's the EPR effect, the enhanced permeability and retention of tumors. So the permeability we recognize as the broke, disrupted blood-brain barrier. Retention is the lack of clearance of any molecule from the tumor. And so this has been exploited just with basic chemotherapy, for example, kind of traditional non-targeted chemotherapy. But many, um, uh, EPR effect has been uh, described for many different um, uh, molecules. So I believe that I am taking advantage of the EPR effect and the disrupted blood-brain barrier for all contrast-enhancing gliomas or meningiomas, or, and I'll show you, we've done virtually every tumor type. And um, we can get, ICG stuck in that tumor, and then wait for it to clear out of all normal structures, and then visualize. So this is a, an example just a, where we just first started. We're doing tail vein injections, flank implants, and there is ICG stuck in that uh, U87 tumor model. Uh, we published that uh, just as our initial experience. Um, the other thing to notice here is that there was a very broad plateau. It like spikes early, but then from 24 to 72 hours later, we had, we could visualize at roughly the same signal. So there was a very slow um, uh, clearance of that dye from, of ICG from the tumor model. So we then did the mouse implants. We used two different models. One was a GL261 and then a U, um, U, U, U87. Um, just two, two different approaches. And then we compared it to 5ALA. So this is um, actually really interesting to me because here you can see this, um, it's not a very infiltrative uh, tumor model, but you, so you have very clean margins, but you can see 5-ALA or protoporphyrin at the periphery, in the center, in the necrotic areas, you don't see as much ICG. But here we have on the other side with the green, um, it's pseudo color overlay of near infrared, which we can't see again with our eyes. Um, you see actually more accumulation in the necrotic areas. And I've actually, uh, we, we are pre preparing some publications about this as well. Uh, one of the problems is that we cannot differentiate necrosis from live tumor, and that is one advantage of um, 5-ALA, which requires enzymatic conversion. Um, one interesting thing is we did a lot of controls with no dye or no tumor. And this was very interesting to me and very instructive because this helped me appreciate autofluorescence. 
So if you excite in the blue, record in the red, there's a lot of structures that you have to be careful that might autofluoresce. In the near infrared, there was very little. So then we did the same kind of tumor uh, control, no tumor, just gave dye, and then just also looked. And so this helps me learn when I am imaging in a normal, hu I mean, a patient with a tumor, what potential confounders are there uh, that uh, may attract dye. Choroid plexus for ICG, for 5ALA, it's the ependema, the corpus callosum, so there's uh, a ventricle wall. So there's, there's always things that we, we can learn um, uh, from the uh, animal models. Now, I, I mentioned earlier that virtually any camera will do. However, to start the research, I need to go to the Dartmouth group, because the Dartmouth group is an excellent, Brian Pogue and his team, and of course, um, uh, the, the whole uh, group there has been one of the world's leaders in fluorescence. And they published a very simple paper, just, but comparing the commercially available camera systems. And I have to say that the ones that we traditionally use with microscopes are very, have very limited dynamic range and very limited sensitivity. Whereas I chose a, the, the best commercially available system that gives me um, the widest dynamic range, the highest sensitivity. Um, it has both an exascope and an endoscope version, so I can um, do a macro perspective. I think the field of view is uh, maybe 10 centimeters at least. Um, so uh, you can do conventional brain tumor surgery. And it has a four millimeter outer diameter endoscope, so I can do pituitary uh, surgery uh, work. And we've published on that as well. Um, so. The other advantage of this system, it uses a laser for excitation. Um, that, what that allows is very um, powerful um, uh, in watts per cm squared. You don't want filtered halogen, which is what many of the systems use. Like you take your little box that we're so used to in the operating room and then just filter out all the visible light and just take the um, near infrared. That is very weak um, excitation source for fluorescence. Um, and um, LEDs are okay, um, they're getting um, better. Um, but of course, if you have a laser just tuned to right at 805, it's gonna be very hard to beat. One of the challenges of operating uh, or doing this type of work um, is that the operating room actually has lots of stray light. So um, when we operate off a video screen doing endoscopy, sometimes you just have to shut some of the lights down because there's just too much, you don't have enough contrast, there's too much glare. Well, we have the same problem in the near infrared. All of the sunlight, sunlight has lots of near infrared. Well, the um, tracking uh, Medtronic Brain Lab um, stereotaxy systems all use near infrared to triangulate. So um, you need to, change systems or divert the system away. I switched to a competitor system which um, actually shoots near infrared the opposite direction. It shoots it to passive cameras uh, suiting up. So that way I don't have my entire field bathed in like, you know, 30 frequency uh, frames per second, like um, near infrared bathing the field. So you do have to um, take this into consideration as you um, change your, uh, I, I had to install double shades in all of my, o in my ORs so that I can just reduce all of the stray light. Um, and um, so what I'm doing is giving boring old ICG, FDA approved in the 1950s. Um, however, I'm giving it at a much higher dose than usual. So usually the, it comes in a vial of 25 milligrams. You constitute it in 10 cc's of water. And um, when you give that, when you um, deliver that, uh, deliver it, you're only giving maybe five or 10 milligram aliquots. You ask the anesthesiologist to give it. Um, we're doing something very different. Um, in those rodent experiments, we were giving um, five milligrams per kilo. So that might be 18 of those vials. Um, so it's a very different um, technique. And then unlike uh, conventional vascular imaging or vascular angiography, we're not watching the bolus come through the vasculature. I'm waiting 24 hours. So we gave that large dose of ICG. I give it in an infusion suite um, as part of an IRB. Now, the FDA approved limit for ICG is actually two milligrams per kilo. So this is all done under IRB. Um, um, so I give five milligrams per kilo, and then we wait till the next day. Then we do the, um, the, the imaging. Um, we, we take advantage of the EPR effect. Uh, we, we've, uh, tra Penn has trademarked this technique, called it tumor glow. And um, 
It works for a variety of tumors. This was something I posted on social media. This was just a simple meningioma. Um, and actually, the meningioma was my first case that I did this on. And I was impressed. Um, so here's a, here's a very simple, straightforward uh, parasagittal meningioma. Um, I think I'm going to, I don't show all that. But here's the near infrared channel only. So this is coded as black and white. Uh, but we can pseudo color this in a minute. But you can clearly see the extent of that tumor. Here, the camera is now pseudo coloring it and then overlaying it directly on top of the um, uh, white light view. And this allows for a beautiful um, uh, representation of what's going on. Then I'm going to cross to the other side now just to open that. And um, meningiomas are the easiest. They, have, uh, they, they accumulate dye very, very easily. You can see how the adjacent dura is not, does not uh, fluoresce, whereas the tumor does. So um, we've done um, over uh, almost 400 cases, although we've actually closed the study at this point. Um, we... We gave two and a half mix per kilo and five. I did a dose de-escalation and we're now preparing all those papers for uh, publication. What, was there any significant difference? In short, there is a little bit of a difference in terms of signal, um, but uh, I think that going down dose is, is perfectly fine. Um, infuse over an hour in a study center and then we do it today. We did have a few adverse events. So patients do get hypertensive during the infusion. And so we had a five, uh, six percent incidence of this. We just slowed down the infusion and it was fine. But in the beginning, actually, we sent one patient to the ER because we didn't know what was going on. But we haven't had uh, that once we slowed down the infusion. So GBM, uh, I showed you this earlier case. Um, let me, uh, so now what we do, I. As part of the protocol, I did not change, alter the way I do my surgery. So the surgery was done um, as part of standard of care, but we do look afterwards. So this is an example. So now I've uh, resected that occipital lobe GBM, and now I'm going to look at the margins. So we turn on the camera again, and we find margins. Now, one thing to take a look, there is nonspecific fluorescence in the, um, in the dura and the skin, but the brain itself, which generally has a very tight intact BBB, is not going to let ICG in, and it's not, and it's going to clear ICG really fast. So I biopsy those margins, and then we calculate P positive PPV, NPV, sensitivity, specificity, etc. And we've published that, and I'll go over some of those results. Here's another interesting case. This is a 21-year-old female. And if you look carefully at the MRI, there are two main areas of contrast enhancement of gadolinium, a small one centimeter one more laterally and anteriorly, and, a, and another one more medial that's a little bit bigger, maybe two, three centimeters. So what I did was more of a, a, a frontal lobectomy um, in order to get a, 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 a largest piece of this as possible, and then image that. I turn it on the lateral side and then the medial side. And in my non-scientific kind of perspective, this is a very good way to identify gadolinium enhancement in the operating room. And you can see that representation right, right here, um, uh, where you have what should have, what, what you would expect uh, um, to fluoresce. Um, now, interestingly, our pathologist did not identify any difference in um, the histology between these two areas. And, but I have not studied that systematically. And I think um, that that's a whole nother area uh, potentially for research. So um, we've had, uh, and I also want to credit Dr. Stephen Brem, who has contributed patients to this study as well. Um, so we have nine, uh, 80 um, high grade gliomas, and our SBR, our signal to background, is very strong. We're at about six. Um, which is uh, brighter than what you'll see, I, I, my opinion, with uh, versus 5ALA. Although uh, we, have, we have a small cohort of co-administered patients, patients who got both 5ALA and ICG, um, but, and that has been published. Um, but it was only three or four patients, and then coronavirus hit. So we, are, we can see through the dura in some cases. Uh, even before I opened the dura, I can find the ICG, if it, if the tumor, if it's close enough to the surface. And I can easily see through the cortex if it's close to the surface. The signal goes up as you open the dura, as one might expect. Um, so publish that. Our sensitivity and specificity, our sensitivity is very good. It's 95%. But our specificity is not great. 
And so I think this is where the challenge, it's not a specific dye, it just leaks into the tumor or leaks into tissue. So our specificity is 55%, 54. Now, interestingly though, PPV is the only metric that was needed to get FDA approval for 5-ALA. So our positive predictive value is 95%, and the PPV of 5-ALA is also 97, 98%. Um, I think they each has different benefits. Um, we've published some of this. We've now another interesting feature of this is, well, since I'm not resecting the near infrared ICG enhancing component, any residual near infrared should predict contrast enhancement on MRI. And so we um, published this study where we just compared our uh, intraoperative imaging to our post-op MRI, and we determined that even volumes as small as 0.3 cc's on, uh, with MRI, we can definitely detect uh, with near-infrared, and we can pretty easily predict the post-op MRI based on residual uh, ICG in the glioma. Um, I trust ICG more than navigation, um, because navigation, sometimes just interpretation of navigation requires some experience, and I find that when I sometimes let more junior um, uh, residents uh, turn, plan the craniotomy, turn it. And um, we, when I open the dura, or even before I open the dura, we're not centered. And this is a very interesting to me, how oftentimes we're not centered over the shortest path to the tumor. And that um, when we actually calculated this and published on this, we clearly showed that, or at least I feel that the shortest path to the tumor is always where the fluorescence is the brightest because to me, it's, it's just, it's where we can excite the fluorophore. Um, so I generally use that uh, as my shortest path to the tumor, unless there is some functional reason not to do that, such as an awake craniotomy and language mapping. Um, how about brain metastases? So I posited that any contrast enhancing, gadolinium enhancing tumor, I can visualize with near infrared. Well, we, um, that definitely is true. Um, and the other challenging thing is, even when we resect completely, there's a 50% recurrence rate at one year uh, based on Patchell's uh, random RCT. So we have 55 patients where we've done this. Um, and uh, here you can see an example of a brain met. And um, again, same thing. We can see through the dura. We can see through the cortex. We also have similar high sensitivity, but low specificity, a high PPV. Um, so uh, here's an example of a, this is actually one of my, uh, again, one of my earliest cases um, uh, a lot of my videos were taken early because it was so exciting, but uh, uh, at this point now. So you can see that we see it through the dura. I can see through the cortex. This is going to be a simple brain met, and um, this is a very straightforward rese resection. So um, with that said, we've, we've published, uh, used this technique with meningiomas. We've used this with metastases. We've uh, Tried this with pituitary adenomas, which tend to be hypo-enhancing when relative to the gland when micro, but uh, enhancing uh, when uh, a macroadenoma. Um, we've used this in other tumors. Um, I have a beautiful video of a craniopharyngioma case that I'd love to show. We've used this in pineal tumors. We've done stereotactic biopsies with this. So why am I so interested in ICG? It's a dull, boring 1950s drug. Um, this is an interesting paper from Japan, uh, colon cancer cells incubated with ICG and fluorescein. And ICG actually is, has an endocytic uptake mechanism for some reason into these colon cancer cells. Now, ICG is commonly used for hepatobiliary, or is FDA approved now for hepatobiliary imaging. And um, Novadac uh, company helped to push that uh, through. And um, so the liver and colon may be a little bit different of a model because we know that this is hepatically excreted. However, um, the fact that ICG is internalized into cells is interesting to me because we actually don't have the capability that this lab group, which um, is, uh, they have a lot of excellent Olympus equipment. I don't have the capability to localize ICG in these tumor specimens. And we've struggled with our, um, uh, our researchers to get um, a technique where we can um, isolate where is the fluorescence coming from. So right now, I just have to say that it's in the tumor parenchyma, but whether it's intracellular or extracellular, I don't know. Um, one of my um, enterprising students, um, she combined ICG with um, gold nanoparticles to 
uh, create both a visual uh, fluorophore and a PDT agent using chlorine-6. Um, so she's pu just published that. That's um, exciting work that she's uh, doing. Although the challenge, obviously, with all nanoparticles is what can we actually give to humans? Um, the other major reason I believe that we all need more experience with ICG and near infrared is that every single startup company out there, and I've worked with on target to do a pituitary study where we, uh, Nelson Oyasiko published many years ago that, um, and actually that was the subject of his uh, K08 and uh, uh, K, uh, I believe it was his K08 and R01, uh, was to look at folate imaging or folate receptor expression in pituitary adenomas. And so they are overexpressed in non-functioning adenomas. So what we did was we, we took OTL38, which is their um, drug, which is folate conjugated to SO486, which is a, um, a, um, uh, a uh, near-infrared molecule. And um, we just imaged pituitary tumors during surgery. We injected them and then imaged. And um, that was very exciting. So what, and that molecule actually, and that company is in phase three clinical trials for uh, ovarian cancer and lung cancer, both of those studies being headed at Penn. Um, so I had access to that drug. Um, every single tumor fluorophore is being conjugated to a near infrared dye. So the more experience we get with near infrared, I mean, this is across the board, um, there's, a, a, I mean, um, so we held a conference in 2018 at Penn, where um, we invited many of the leading, um, leading investigators um, to come and present their clinical data and experience with uh, their host of near-infrared molecules. Um, some are tagged to EGFR, some are tagged to VEGF, anti-VEGF antibodies. Um, I know that uh, Linton Evans probably at, at, at Dartmouth has access to the, some of the EGFR AFA body uh, work that's being done there. Um, so... Uh, we need to understand and be familiar with near-infrared more than we are currently. Um, another reason ICG is so interesting is that ICG has another emission peak in the far infrared. Now, we've been talking about near-infrared around 835, but when you go really far out, uh, close to the short wave, there's no biologic contamination whatsoever. On top of that, you theoretically, you can image centimeters deep. And so what's interesting is ICG's got, now the cameras that we use to image that deep have come down in price as LIDARs have become more uh, important for self-driving cars. Uh, this was only military available technology for a while, but now is available to researchers and uh, the rest of us. So in the far, in the short wave or the far infrared, um, there is a peak with ICG, and um, this is a PNAS paper um, where they showed injected ICG, simple old ICG, tail vein, used a INGAS, indium gallium arsenic sensor, and were able to get beautiful imaging of ICG and vasculature. And I, after that paper, this group in China uh, published this uh, Nature Biomedical Engineering paper where they also just used ICG in human patients, they looked also in the short wave or the NIR2 window, or, um, and um, they were able to demonstrate much better imaging, superior um, signals, signal to background, and better sensitivity as compared to standard, um, um, uh, standard near-infrared imaging. So it, ICG is a dumb old drug, but it's got a lot of potential. It's very exciting. I mean, I'm very excited for the next generation of fluorophores that we are all working on that'll be targeted imaging, targeted agents. Um, I really credit uh, Quen Nguyen, who is a um, head and neck or otology, ot 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 otolaryngologist at UC San Diego, who worked with Roger Tsien, uh, Nobel laureate who passed away. Um, but uh, she has this great TED talk on color-coded um, surgery, where she talks about one day, Tumors will be brightly lit one color. The seventh nerve will be brightly lit another color. The, you'll inject some, you'll do a motor task and then have that like pathway up to the brain clearly, um, you know, I, with some ion channel for four. And it will look like a netter drawing. So then surgery will be able to be done by anybody. And until that day, though, we got to keep working.
Um, so in conclusion, um, second window ICG is a very um, easy technique. Uh, we're working on ways to make this um, simpler. The camera systems that we currently use need to be improved, uh, at least for near infrared imaging. Um, I actually have a whole talk that I deleted from this, which was comparing it to 5ALA. I didn't uh, include that here um, because I, um, and um, we are hosting a, our second interop molecular imaging conference on November 6th at Penn. And um, of course it'll be virtual. So I definitely invite you all uh, to attend that. And um, I think we'll uh, leave it there. I'll take any questions. Um, Go, go back to, uh, go back to uh, taking questions. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Lee. That was, that was phenomenal and, and really exciting to be uh, seeing somebody push the direction uh, beyond, um, you know, in, in other directions. So let's just get to a couple questions here. Is, uh, one is, is from Alexander Ortiz. How does cell count influence the efficiency or efficacy of fluorophores? And is the genetic growth potential of the tumor taken into account in this type of approach? So, Cell density, um, microvascular density, a lot of these things um, may potentially influence, but I've not studied that. And um, I would welcome anyone who has an interest in doing that. Um, uh, that was part one. Number two was, what was the second part of that question? Uh, anything Sorry. about growth potential? Can you can you get out of the like the K sixty seven maybe uh, of the of the tumor by their fluorescence? Yeah, I I honestly don't think this has really much to do with its tumor's aggressiveness as much as it has to do with the broken a disrupted blood brain barrier because I've done juvenile polycytic astrocytomas J, uh, grade one and they are brightly in, uh, fluorescing with ICG. Meningiomas are brightly fluorescing. I have a video of a craniopharyngioma I'll show with some uh, questionable residual on the hypothalamus. Do you take it or not? So I, I don't think it's the KI67 as much as it is um, disruption of BBB. Uh, another one by uh, uh, Nicola Melita. Uh, can you use AI uh, to help improve specificity and guide surgery with this technique? That is um, obviously very futuristic um, and um, important uh, direction. We've, always, we've talked about that a lot. I mean, that goes around, comes around every few months um, discussion. But um, I think at this point right now, what we're still trying to do is, uh, you know, I think ICG is a dumb drug. It just leaks into the tumor. What the whole field is going to right now is tumor specificity. How can I... Um, I uh, come up with an agent or a fluorophore that gives me um, some unique molecular signature that I can visualize in the operating room. Now, everyone is targeting something different. I mean, there are some environmental dyes, for example. I'm really excited for um, Onco Nano, uh, which has a pH transistor, they call it a pH transistor, but um, it's a pH sensitive dye. Um, there's a lot of different attempts to um, talk, but I think the brain is unique because we have a very, very tight blood brain barrier that doesn't let much in. And then low grade gliomas can be very hard to differentiate from the normal brain, even for experienced pathologist uh, on H and E. And so what molecular features are we going to be able to target that allows us to provide some contrast from the brain? So I think that's uh, I think that's one of our, our, our I mean, I think that's our, our major challenge. Yeah, I mean, my question is really is, is as we become more specific, you know, how, how is that going to help us in the end guide us towards the end? As we know, uh, glioma cells migrate throughout the brain. And so even if you could see every single glioma cell in the brain, you still as a surgeon need to make that decision as when to stop and when is the density appropriate to stop? And, and when, when does it kind of make a difference? And it's a complex uh, decision making with, with obviously functionality and, and cell density and, and whatnot. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that, um, well, number one, if we can deliver something specifically, well, then that obviously has implications for both radiographic imaging, um, PET imaging, that has implications for theranostics. So 
Um, for example, there is um, somatostatin receptors. There is now a um, pet, uh, uh, you have pet imaging for SSTR. And now you also have the Theranostic um, with, I think, yttrium or um, I forget which uh, exactly uh, isotope they're delivering for treatment. So that's one, uh, one aspect because, um, so if you have specificity, you can also deliver um, something more specifically. Uh, but then also my approach to this is as a surgeon, um, my goal is just simply to do the best job at surgery that I can. I can't leave behind random chunks of tumor because I didn't see it. And um, for that, that's my goal, to be the best surgeon possible. Now, I think there's also this future of normal tract imaging. So for example, I, I have colleagues who are enthralled by DTI imaging. Um, and it's so colorful and pretty, but when you look at the brain, it still it looks exactly the same, that white matter when I'm operating as it does, uh, you know, it did before DTI imaging. I can't see any tracks, but imagine if you could. Um, so there, there's a lot to be done. I think the future of molecular imaging is, is unlimited potential at this point. Um, we're, we're just starting, we, we've been able to do this a lot in the laboratory and in animals and, you know, voltage gated channel. I mean, there's been a lot that we've been able to uh, image, you know, you know, those beautiful immunofluorescence images of, of, intra, you know, cellular level detail. Um, but we've done none of that in the operating room. And we have that potential to do that here because we have the brain open and exposed. And if we find the right combination or right appropriate use of um, uh, molecular imaging, we, we're going to, we might see things that we've just never seen before. I mean, it's, it's, it's exciting. Uh, one more question before we get to our um, talks is, is there's a couple of uh, people here asking about your, your opinion on sodium fluorescein. And, uh, and do you feel like that's similar to what you're doing and advantages or disadvantages to sodium fluorescein to the ICG? I have some ideas about sodium fluorescein, um, but honestly, I haven't used it um, because um, uh, so I, I, I don't want to um, say, I, I, don't, I don't want to compare and contrast because I just don't have enough experience. Okay. Okay. Uh, so let's get to our, uh, uh, Dr. Jones uh, and get to some of the cases. Uh, maybe we could kind of talk about pros and cons and different kinds of fluorescence as we go through them. Great. Can everyone see my screen? Awesome. Yeah, it looks good. Okay, great. Well, thanks, Dr. Lee, for that awesome talk. Very exciting work. And thank you to the directors, Dr. Ivan, Dr. Morcos, Dr. Komotar, Dr. Benjamin, um, and my fellow panelists. So I'll be talking about two applications of 5-ALA fluorescence in malignant glioma, uh, a case of awake language mapping, and then some of our use of 5-ALA for liquid biopsy. So first is this 63-year-old gentleman, right-handed, who presented with uh, several weeks of speech arrest to my office. He underwent brain MRI, and other than the known large uh, left uh, temporal arachnoid cyst, he also had this new three by two and a half by two centimeter rim enhancing lesion of the left temporal parietal lobe. So I had him undergo functional MRI, and he was left hemisphere language dominant. He had Wernicke's activation in the posterior superior temporal gyrus, as well as the supermarginal gyrus, and then on uh, tractography, the arcuate fasciculus coursed along the anterior medial tumor margin. So here we can see in that um, tractography, the arcuate fasciculus, um, and then exactly as Dr. Lee said in the pictures, it's very pretty, bright green, and it courses right along this anterior margin of the tumor. And so of course I did this case awake. Um, we loaded the DTI into our brain lab image guidance. Um, it, we had great activation of positive mapping of Wernicke's correlating with the functional MRI. And then we confirmed negative mapping and, and had a nice trajectory down to abnormal tumor. So unfortunately, I don't have this case captured on, on video, but it, we had avid bright pink fluorescence of the tumor. Um, and so I was able to find a nice non-fluorescent border around these um, you know, safer margins, posteriorly, inferiorly, and superiorly, and left the anterior margin uh, for last. And so under, well, it was still, um, had some thickness of abnormal tumor, 
that was apparent under white light and then also avidly fluorescent, uh, performed subcortical mapping and his language remained at baseline. So I continued under gentle suction, um, thinning out that border until it became paler. And then um, it, to the point where under subcortical stimulation, I, was, uh, I stimulated an arrest in repetition and a change in reading comprehension. And at that point, there was no significant avid fluorescence, maybe, you know, pale, pale pink, um, but figured that had guided me to the extent of maximum resection. Unfortunately, you know, it would have been nice if that tractography was showing bright green intra-op, but it was not. But now I know what the future may hold. And so here's our post-op day one MRI, which showed no obvious remaining contrast enhancement in this tumor that um, turned out to be an IDH1 wild type glioblastoma, MGMT methylated. He did well with his language post-op and has done well through treatment. Um, so this is just a case where I just think 5-ALA or image, uh, fluorescence image, um, real-time guidance is just so incredibly helpful. Um, you know, it's a case where you, you know, surgery matters and you want to get as much out as you possibly can, um, but safely. And so having that real-time image where you can take it to the maximum border, um, both with the feedback from your subcortical mapping, as well as the visualization of a transition of bright pink to pale pink was extremely helpful. I find, you know, with intraoperative MRI and language mapping, you get into this problem of thinking you've done enough and then you put them to sleep for the MRI and you run into the problem of if there's residual, having to wake them back up to then do safer, further resection. Uh, for the cases where you're not aiming to do a gross total resection and you're, um, and it's really a, or a diagnosis, you know, these can be challenging cases as well. Uh, there can be some, you know, dangerous deep biopsies that we don't always love doing and they can put patients at risk. Um, so our group has looked into liquid biopsy for this reason, you know, um, giving a patient a diagnosis based on a blood draw or CSF sample to determine if they have a tumor and what genetic subtype it might be. And then tracking a patients of all tumor types and, and locations um, through treatment, um, whether a blood draw could assess their response to treatment or whether the tumor is recurring. And so our group was wondering, you know, in this fluorescent guided surgery, actually could the fluorescence um, help improve our biomarker sensitivity because we run into the problem of in one cc of blood, there are a billion extracellular vesicles or these um, EVs that butt off every single cell in the body. And how can we tell which ones are tumor EVs and therefore allow us, for you know, allow us to diagnose that tumor? So enter in our, uh, this six patient uh, cohort that we studied who underwent, they all had glioblastomas and underwent fluorescent guided surgery with 5-ALA. Four of them had avidly fluorescent tumors. Um, two of them did not, and that is um, mostly due to one being brought to the OR probably too soon after oral administration of the agent. And then also this, the second was lo a longer window and it was just highly necrotic. And so Dr. Lee spoke to that, just poor uptake in necrosis. And this is uh, representative pictures of the example of fluorescence in four of those patients as compared to, you know, best case scenario for the two patients with really non-fluorescent tumors. And one patient was really negligible. And so what we found was that on image flow cytometry in this channel 11 or the spectrum where you expect protoporphyrin 9 fluorescence, um, at baseline, we draw through blood and looked at the plasma. And, you know, as Dr. Lee said, there was some baseline nanoparticle autofluorescence among these patients. And then in a, from plasma taken during that surgery, we saw a rise in that protoporphyrin 9 nanoparticle signal on image flow cytometry only in the four patients who had the avidly fluorescent tumor. In patients with non-fluorescent tumor, that signal remained flat or decreased. And furthermore, uh, that fold change from baseline um, to signal to a high signal occurred um, commensurate with the tumor volume contrast enhancing size. So patient one had the largest 
contrast enhancing tumor volume. And they also had the greatest fold change in nanoparticle fluorescent signal on our uh, flow cytometry versus patient four who had the smallest volume tumor and the smallest fold change in signal. So in summary, 5-ALA I feel is a key adjunct, uh, especially for language mapping cases and motor mapping cases. Um, and I think it really offers an advantage over intraoperative MRI given its real time tumor assessment while you, the patient is awake and you can get a sense of what harm you're causing and stop you know, before you cause harm, um, but not stop too soon. Um, so our, some of my group's research, preliminary data suggests that protoporphyrin 9 positive EDs can be detected using image flow cytometry, and that fluorescent tumors under 5-ALA have these protoporphyrin 9 EDs in circulation. So it's really just proof of concept work for possibly future plasma-based liquid tumor biopsy using 5-ALA or other um, fluorescent agents. So thank you so much for your attention. And again, thank you for allowing me to participate today. And I look forward to questions and being part of the panel. Thanks, Pamela. That was awesome. Uh, have, you, have you seen uh, when the tumor is resected or when it recurs, does the correlation of the fluorescence and the EVs correlate? I'm sure you're looking at that now, right? We are going to, so we don't have that work yet, but that really is the key. Because I think, you know, other than the challenging biopsies, um, you know, the real role for, um, for a, you know, a main role for liquid biopsy is to track progression versus pseudo progression. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're doing a little bit of PDT, if I really work in my lab, and, and we found that there's also this big difference between some glioblastomas that are high and low fluorescent. Uh, we actually found that two, that cell size is a major impact. So large uh, cell gliomas versus small cell gliomas have a, a difference in the amount of fluorescence, even if you kind of equilibrate for the, the amount of cell you're looking at. Hmm. Um, so it'll be interesting to see kind of how that all pans out with the differences between uh, kind of who fluoresces the most and who doesn't. But there's, there definitely is a disparity between or heterogeneity between gliomas. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. There is. Dr. Lee or anybody else uh, comments? When are you drawing those EVs, that serum sample? Yeah, so that's another future work. So that's during the surgery at the time of, you know, the craniotomy. So before we've done any tumor work, um, but not so long in time that, you know, it would have gone from non-fluorescent to fluorescent. So pretty close timing, but before we've, you know, manipulated the tumor to put it at risk for kind of going into the bloodstream. Any correlation with time for the... And so we followed them longitudinally over like at two week draws and six week draws. We didn't follow the, follow their blood like in the first 24 hours. It was just too, um, too challenging in terms of frequency of blood draws. But we did see that signal drop back down to that kind of baseline um, auto fluorescence. And I had, a, you know, I think I have a hidden slide on that. But yeah, basically the only rise in those patients were the ones that we took during surgery. And then when they were coming back post-op, it was back towards the baseline levels or even lower. Because one thing, an uh, interesting thing is, you know, P PP9 is photo bleach is very fast. So, you know, you have to really protect your sample, limit light. Uh, I mean, so I'm sure there's, you have all these techniques down. Um, so we did. We, yeah, we have um, them all covered in, um, in uh, tin foil. And we, uh, in our, so, you know, what led us to do the adult work was some work with mice. And we showed that, you know, if we, we after sacrificing the mice, and keeping their brains in the dark and frozen, that even up to several weeks later when we looked at the, the brain specimens that had been kept in the dark and frozen, they still had fluorescence. So mm. it actually preserved pretty well if we kept it out of light. Okay, uh, thank you, Pam. Uh, Dr. Evans? All right, well, uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, listen in and also share some cases as well. Um, I'm just gonna show two uh, relatively small cases that highlight uh, some of the use of ALA in different applications and then also how 
Uh, our group at Dartmouth is currently trying to push the limits of, of what you can do imaging, um, you know, using a, a, a fluorescent dye in the visible range. Um, so this first patient was a 72-year-old male that presented with uh, left-hand uh, paresthesias and clumsiness and was subsequently found to have this mass. Um, this is a, a white light image from the operating room. Um, you know, we did uh, mapping to demonstrate that the, the mass was located behind the post-central gyrus. Um, you can see the blue light image as well on the right side. And, and really at this point, because we could, um, wanted to do an anatomic or extra lesional resection. And I've been finding uh, even doing an extra lesional resection, it's very helpful with, with, with ALA, not so much using the blue light throughout the resection looking for a fluorescence, but ensuring in some sense that you don't, you don't see it. Um, so we came around the entire lesion. Um, and, and you can see on this image, it's a little blurry, but this was the, the mass removed on block. Um, and really, you can see how the fluorescence recapitulates the gadolinium en enhancement that, that Dr. Lee pointed out, that you see a very uh, sort of brisk, very bright, uh, visible fluorescence um, that correlates with the contrast enhancements and then certainly a dark uh, central core um, where there's necrosis and you're not seeing uh, visible fluorescence. Um, and then also a margin where you're not seeing uh, visible fluorescence as well. Um, and finding that this is a very efficient way using it at the end. You don't have much blood in the field, um, you know, that obscures the blue light absorption. It's certainly much more efficient than using uh, an intraoperative MRI um, and a nice adjunct to the ultrasound and, and certainly to using, relying on this more than image guidance when you have so much deformation at the end of resection. Um, this is a different case to show, highlight really how uh, we're exploiting imaging uh, with the microscope as well as the absorption spectra of ALA to highlight different things. So this was a, another um, older gentleman presenting with seizures, uh, was found to have a mass. This is the, the white light image of the cortex um, that you can see at the time of surgery. Um, this next image is, is showing a couple of features. Um, one is the, the white light image on the left. The middle panel shows an image under blue light and you can see some visible fluorescence. Um, and then within the microscope, we actually have a camera system embedded um, that can generate a wide field image um, of fluorescence PP9 concentration. Um, and, and so you can appreciate, one, you're able to generate a color map that's overlaid in the heads up display. Um, and two, in areas where the visible fluorescence isn't really robust, you're still able to appreciate PP9 accumulating. Similarly, um, the throughout resection and the time of resection, you can see here's the white light image. Uh, there's visible fluorescence at the end of resection um, or during resection. At the end of resection, again, just under blue light, not appreciating any visible fluorescence. And, and two questions is sort of what lies beneath this? What are you not appreciating just by the absence of visible fluorescence? Um, and, and again, one of the things that our group has found using both a wide field imaging system as well as a handheld probe that's basically a handheld spectrophotometer, that even below the, the visible limits of detection, there still is significant concentrations of PP9 accumulating. Uh, the panel H shows the emission spectra of PP9. It is PP9. It fits that, that, that curve. Um, and then when you biopsy that or sample that section, histologically it's tumor. So, um, you know, it's tumor that at the end of resection, if you're just relying on what you're seeing under the microscope in terms of visible fluorescence, you're, you're missing some of the information um, that, that can be generated using PP9. The other, as Dr. Lee talked about too, is, you know, the, the fact that, um, you know, there's heavy absorption of, of blood uh, at a blue light wavelength um, and that there's very little tissue penetration. So using the absorption uh, spectrum of PP9 and knowing that there's a second absorption peak um, at 495 under red light, we augmented the microscope with a red light filter. Um, and just to highlight what you can then do, this is the white light image while dura is still intact on the same case. The blue light image, you're not seeing any visible uh, PP9. With our probe, we're also not able to measure PP9. Then when we generate a, a 
quantitative map using red light imaging, which you see on the left that's overlaid, you can see that you're appreciating PP9 now that you weren't before. Um, and it, it matches very closely with the level of, um, level of visible fluorescence that you're seeing once the dirt is reflected. So just even though, even with the limitations of using PP9 and, and um, you know, a visible dye, uh, you're able to sort of expand what you can do with it, achieve some increased penetration, even by just um, exciting uh, the surgical field or the PP9 with a different, a different wavelength um, and, and garnering more information. So we've, we found in a, a smaller uh, cohort of about 24 patients um, that we're able to actually have some increased tissue penetration and depth just using red light uh, excitation versus the standard blue that's on the, the microscopes. Um, so, you know, I, I think as we start to, you know, synthesize new dyes and, and potentially use uh, multiple dyes or fluorophores in, in combination, um, that you really can exploit what we, we currently have, both just with, with improved imaging, as, as Dr. Lee talked about, um, and really really sort of use the, the fluorophores that we have to their fullest, their fullest potential. Um, so this is, is work that, that stems from a large collaboration between neurosurgery and certainly Dr. Roberts, and then also the engineering group uh, here at DARPA. Thanks, Dr. Evans. That's, that's, uh, I mean, you got, your group has probably one of the most and longest series of using 5-ALA, and so it's, it's good to hear that uh, a, you're still using it, and, and B, that uh, you're really pushing it to the next limits. I agree. I mean, I think that this is one of the, the limitations of 5LA, and if you're able to overcome it, the visibility and penetration, that would be key. It's always frustrating when you are staring at a cavity that looks light pink, and then you try to manipulate the tissue a little bit, and then all of a sudden you find another large dark pink area that indicates you still have a ways to go. Um, and, and sometimes you, you don't know how to trust that or not, but if you could see penetrating all the way through that, uh, I think that would be really, really helpful. Yeah, I think I, I, I've, I invited um, David Roberts to talk at our course, and I was always impressed with the engineering um, help uh, that you guys have at Dartmouth, and um, you've clearly demonstrated the benefits of that. We. I don't know how, actually I've talked to some, some people in the fluorescent imaging space and when they look at what we do in neurosurgery with 5ALA, they actually have no idea why we accept such poor quality imaging. And um, our imaging for 5ALA is so primitive um, that it kind of befuddles the engineers. Uh, and um, I think there's a lot of opportunity for improvement. And uh, I think we need to, um, I think the, honestly, I think the microscope companies have been enthralled by vascular surgeons for a long time and have not been influenced heavily by the tumor surgeons. I think that will change with some time, uh, especially since vascular has moved a lot to endovascular. And I think we need to demand excellent fluorescent tumor imaging. And there, um, that is absolutely critical to this work. And the images you just showed, Dr. Evans, are an example of how a, a quantitative processing of wavelength, different specific wavelengths um, can really boost the, the image. And um, that is something that an optics company may not have the expertise of the, the quantitative uh, computer expertise. And so um, that is, uh, you know, you can think of the, op like think of, think of Kodak. I mean, Kodak went bankrupt. They were the, and they actually invented the first digital camera. Um, so it's um, interesting times. Digital imaging, you know, I came from this from the world of endoscopy. And um, for me to look on the screen for near infrared was like, was and it didn't have there was no reper, you know has no difference but I know that many of the legacy older surgeons uh, to look away from the microscope is a challenge but um, the computer uh, and set the sensors um, and processing power that can be applied to augment and uh, suppress uh, noise 
and background images, we're going to be able to see so much more soon. Um, so. Uh, Linton, uh, so the, the red, the red uh, filter and then the wide, wide lens, are those kind of applications that the, the, the scope companies are working on or, or where are they in, in uh, usability for the rest of us? Uh, so currently those are all modifications that are, are homegrown. Um, I, I know there's uh, interest, I think, in, in pushing it commercially and making it available, um, but currently those are all modifications that haven't been jumped on by um, some of the, you know, the larger scope companies. And I, and I think, too, just with these imaging platforms, ALA is just the starting point. I mean, you can apply these same these the same quantitative measures to other floor floors at different wavelengths. So, um, I mean, I think it's really a robust tool to build on um, as, as, you know, fluorescence guided surgery and neurosurgery continues to advance. In, in a dart myth, are you primarily using it just for gliomas or are you using it uh, now for all tumors? So uh, as one of our protocols, uh, we've, we're using it for all, you know, meningiomas, METs, um, gliomas high and low grade um, and and so that was sort of the original and, and still are enrolling some patients in that study now focusing much more on uh, high grade gliomas in particular um, and, and looking at some you know EGFR targeted fluorophores um, so so at this point looking more at, at glioma certainly. Great great excellent work thank you so much for sharing that. Thank uh, you. Dr. D'Amico. Hey guys. Um, so as every time I follow the last, everyone's pretty much discussed kind of the main things I wanted to talk about. And so I'd like to kind of keep it open for the panelists because I think it's more interesting this way anyway. Um, I've actually used uh, everything except ICG. Uh, at Columbia, I actually uh, had brought in fluorescein initially when I was there in residency and did um, a lot of work with Jeff Bruce with that. And now at Lenox, I've brought 5LA here. We actually didn't have it until recently. And so I've got to play around with kind of the unique features of both of these things. And there's actually a bunch in the, a bunch of questions in the Q&A about fluorescein. So I'm going to try to touch base about some of that stuff too. Um, John, I think what you've done is incredible. I mean, you, you've kind of, everyone's doing, you know, 5ALA, 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 and you've kind of taken this novel, you know, fluorophore, a not so novel fluorophore, right? And really pushed it independently. Um, but I, and I think the features are very similar to fluorescein. So there's definitely, you know, something there and, and, and you've done incredible work with it. And I think, uh, you know, you guys have already touched on this, but the, this is an exciting time for fluorescent guided surgery. And for two reasons, number one is we've just started looking at the potential for this, right? And uh, both, you know, what Pamela's doing, what Linton's doing, and then what Mike suggested also about where's the end of this, you know, at some point you can't take out every single cell and, you know, where you stop. But also, it, it just makes surgeons better, potentially. It makes outcomes better for patients at the more basic level, right? And that's why I really actually like fluorescein as a whole. I've, I've kind of adopted it. I work at a community hospital in addition to Lenox Hill. And out there, I, I made them buy a fluorescein scope because just with a little bit of experience, you can actually get a similar result for, for less of a price, you know? For research purposes, I like 5ALA. For basic, you know, neurosurgery, I'm, I'm comfortable with fluorescein and, and, it's, and it's cheap and inexpensive, so that's great. But anyway, I think it's, it's a very exciting time. I'm going to share my screen. I'll show you a few things um, just to kind of move forward. Uh, one second. So the first thing I was going to show was, uh, and again, people have kind of already discussed this, but this was a 52-year-old uh, you know, gentleman this who presented is, uh, with- wrong, wrong screen, Randy. Oh, you guys not seeing the right one? Hold on. The, the internet screen. Great. Let's try again. Is that coming out now? Yeah, that's better. Powerful. And so the main thing here was a small satellite lesion that you guys can see um, away from this, you know, large multifocal GBM. And so uh, going in for resection, you know, you, we know we're leaving something behind in a case like this, but you don't want to leave behind something that's, you know, very close to where you're going to be operating anyway. And this is where I think fluorescein is pretty powerful. Um, this was the tumor was actually, or not fluorescein, sorry, 5 This is the tumor. You can see it's actually very, very, um, 5 ALA bright, which, you know, these tumors are heterogeneous and you don't really know what you're going to get and encounter. And then I apologize that the video is a little bit blurry, but I think it's, you know, it shows, it demonstrates the utility of something like this. The resection, the primary resection is down here. And then this, we, you know, we light it up at the end of the case and we see there's some 
red uh, showing up outside. And so you can see that's where it's kind of outside of the resection cavity. And we're able to follow that and, uh, you know, gentle suction like we discussed before. And you can actually see there's a moment here where the, where, you know, the redness changes in color right there. And that's the margin. And, you know, and we end up, you know, taking out that last bit of redness and you end up with a really nice um, radiographic result. Let me just move through. And specifically that satellite lesion is taken out. And so the way I use this is really an insurance policy. And it's kind of like what John mentioned, how he's doing ICG, where, you know, you do the surgery like you were trained to do the surgery, what your, your initial intention was. And then at the end of the case, you can turn it on and make sure that you got every little last bit and you end up with a nice clean resection. Um, this was, I was going to discuss kind of uh, the importance of being discriminatory with how you use this. Um, especially in, you know, in areas that are, um, you know, functionally eloquent and making sure that you rely on your subcortical mapping. Uh, that case that I was just going to show you is uh, near subcortical motor fibers. And, you know, you, you look, you know, you look down the microscope and you see pink tissue and you have to stop yourself if you're getting positive stims. And, you know, it's frustrating, you know, you're leaving tumor behind and you just have to stop. Um, but I wanted to actually just as a change of pace, just go to the fluorescein stuff. So fluorescein, um, you know, you pointed out some of the benefits to it and the reason I do like it. And I think it speaks to, you know, why ICG is a great tool also, is it really does have to do with blood brain barrier breakdown for the most part. But the nice thing is how visible it is and how um, you can actually see it, you know, and actually operate under that light. With the 5ALA, you have to, I, I really don't feel comfortable operating with it, um, with it on. I don't know how you guys feel. Uh, you know, if I know I'm within a gyrus, you know, like we, like I just showed you, I'll do it. But for the most part, I want it, I want white light to operate in. Um, and this is evident, this is data we had out of Columbia, but we had actually seen that uh, the sensitivity oh, was. Your, your screen again, Randy. Oh, oh, Jesus. It? Sorry, it's like my first time or something. Let me see if it'll pop back up. Showing up now? Yeah, we can see. Yeah. And so we had taken biopsies from fluorescent and non-fluorescent tissue. And the main thing here is, is just this slide, you know, John, you talked about the positive predictive value before, and we had a, we had great positive predictive value in contrast enhancing areas, but then we also had good positive predictive value in non-enhancing regions, about 96%. And so again, you know, with a little bit of experience, you know, relying on something that extravasates through blood brain barrier breakdown, is a reliable technique and you can use these things to make, you know, to make sure your outcomes are good and to, to find tumor tissue. And uh, I'll actually show you just again, cause a video for people to see um, just what this looked like, but I think I stopped sharing again real quick. Yep. I don't want to take up too much time, but let's get this out of here. Sorry. But anyway, I think, you know, the, the field's super exciting. I wanted to get your guys' opinions about kind of, you know, how you guys use this now. Because what I've done now is decide on, you know, I'm working on an algorithm for how I'm going to incorporate this into my practice. I like doing, you know, especially with ideas of super maximal resection, I like doing big anatomic resections if you can. But you still want to try to find a way to, um, to use the floor force because I do find that they are helpful. Here, this is um, our, this is what fluorescein looks like intra-op. And so I think we'll go under fluorescent um, here. And this is a MET. So this is, I, you know, this is again, small community hospital using this for a MET. And you can actually see, you know, good delineation of tissue and tumor. Uh, there is some bleed through without a doubt, which is why, again, I think it, it does rely on experience. You know, you have to be comfortable using it. Let me pull forward a little bit. And here you can see, you know, the, uh, hold on, sorry. Here's a nice, you know, tumor on one side and normal brain on the other side. And so, you know, it, it's, and the nice thing is you can operate under this for some period of time. So, so yeah, you know, it's interesting. When I compare fluorescein and ICG, I think that um, because I've waited 24 hours, some of that bleed through that you're showing right at the cortex with the MET, I don't really see. Um, yeah. I think that fluorescein, for me, at least within the time frames that you're injecting, which is what, about an hour or two? Yeah, it's about an hour, yeah. Kind of induction of anesthesia or something like that. I've always wondered 
what if we just waited 24 hours of fluorescein? It washes out. Yeah. <laughs> Is it gone? Yeah, I think that 24 hours would be too long. You know, in our in our work, we had done up to about, you know, four to eight hours and we still had decent levels. But um, I think in mouse studies in general, you do you do see washout over time. But it'd be, you know, it's it's always so difficult to push that envelope in, in human. You got to go back to you mice know, and preclinical. It's always interesting because when I um, started publishing on this ICG work, I pulled old papers from Mitch Berger. And, um, oh, I forgot the first author on this paper. He's a practicing nurse, I forget where. But he um, did time uh, ICG and just kept looking, 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 looking. And he went out to about 60 minutes. I was like, oh, man, if he had just gone 24 hours, I would have been scooped. <laughs> and um, um, I, I've always wondered, fluorescein, whether that would work. But um, yeah, I don't know if there's a patient who cancels surgery or there's some issue and then you take them the next day, uh, you, you might be surprised. But the, the, that Japanese paper, though, did suggest that fluorescein is not intracellular uptake. And so no, it, made clear, it made completely clear, whereas um, ICG, I think, has different uh, pa- a reason why it sticks around. Yeah. Listen, I think everyone highlighted the key points. I think that the main thing is that it's very exciting times and there's a lot of different options. And so I think it's a, it's very cool to be involved with this kind of research. I also think the digitization of this stuff, right? That's quantification of data. So, you know, someone brought up AI in the Q and A before. I think that's very realistic where rather than, you know, the surgeon deciding is that pink or is it red? You know, all of a sudden you have numbers and you can, you know, AI will be able to look at that with experience and correlate it to contrast enhancement and, you know, come up with an algorithm that works. Yeah, we recently just published our, our AI data with the Raman histology. Uh, and, yeah. uh, and I think that's definitely going to be one indication of they're already applying the 5 LA filter to the Raman um, spectroscoper uh, uh, machine and uh, to see if you could figure out thresholds on instantaneous biopsy um, as to how much tumor would be and what the threshold of that would be. So it, it's definitely coming for sure. And, and, you know, obviously you could then move that from uh, to handheld Raman uh, spectrometry as well. Uh, one other question for Dr. Moore, uh, Dr. Ali that came up here by Dr. Moore from uh, UAB was uh, the combination of fluorocore. So, you know, there's, there's now with the scopes, they're selling you the, the vascular and the tumor and whatnot, but, uh, but what are your thoughts about combining both um, kind of vascular and tumor, different fluorocores for different agents at the same time uh, and, and using different filters at the same time? Yeah, I touched upon that question. Yeah, I touched upon that earlier. And I think that that is absolutely where we will all go. I think that, um, you know, Da Vinci intuitive surgical is spending a lot of money uh, investing and thinking about um, how to visualize the ureter, how to visualize the nerves. Um, Quen Nguyen started a company and there's another company started by uh, um, Gibbs uh, in uh, Washington um, to look at normal nerves, basically a fluorophore for normal nerves, especially during prostate surgery. Um, and uh, Nguyen's uh, work originally was seventh nerve for uh, parotid tumor imaging, for, or seventh nerve imaging for, during parotid surgery, for example. And um, so there is no question that um, this is going to have a big impact in many different areas, and each company tries to find its killer app. Um, and um, uh, we, unfortunately, and this is what I've learned when trying to work with companies over the years, is that we, unfortunately, are a tiny, tiny market. And as much as we love to get together and you have 130 participants in this uh, uh, wonderful Zoom, we're mar- our market is so tiny that <laughs> the companies don't care about us. <laughs> so as much as I complain and want this or want that, that I, unless it's applicable to something else, they're not going to build it for us. Um, so, uh, you know, we have to piggyback off of the bigger cancers, off of the lung, the breast, the prostates, and then hopefully we'll find um, something interesting. I mean, the, the nerve fluorophores are um, exciting too, but, um, you know, I, I always think about it doing acoustic surgery. Um, if I could just find seven faster, this surgery would move a lot faster. <laughs> so, um, John, so, did yeah. you ever look at, IC, you said you looked at ICG for pituitaries, right? You ever look for Cushing's? My yeah, I, I, so unfortunately, it, it, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't work. And actually, it was that was predicted by Oyasiku's. Uh, so first of all, Cushing's are mic are hypo enhancing, so that I have the opposite problem. The gland will be brighter. Second, even when I tried OTL thirty eight folate, uh, uh, Oyasiku's data 
predicted that um, functioning adenomas do not overexpress um, uh, folate. Uh, so uh, we are still on a quest for a better dye. And I have um, lots of, I have an idea and we're moving forward, but you know, Cushing's disease is orphan, orphan to disease. Uh, trying to get funding for that is going to be next to impossible. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, I, 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 if we do have time, I'll show you this, uh, this craniopharyngioma case. Yeah, we have 10 um, minutes. We appreciate it. Uh, let me uh, get that on here. And um, so this was uh, just a craniopharyngioma I did years ago. And I remember I being so excited by this case because um, so this is the T1 without contrast. And then you see the T1 with. And um, so I know that this will fluoresce. There's this cyst over to the left. Um, and then that's going to be a little bit challenging. So here's the exposure of uh, the uh, chiasm, there's the tumor, there's the normal cella, pituitary below me, I'm uh, work, working on it. Now I'm taking a look with the um, four millimeter uh, uh, fluorescent uh, camera, just uh, seeing, so clearly there's ICG in there, but it's not in the optic chiasm, for example. Uh, there's a little bit of nonspecific in the dura, maybe of the cella, but you know, uh, that uh, there's also a proximity effect. You have to be careful if you go too close with endoscopes, you can kind of make everything uh, fluoresce. So here I'm just dissecting. Uh, there's, looks like the PCA um, just working. And then um, now working out laterally toward that cyst and uh, peeling it uh, there off the hypothalamus and just kind of uh, working that. And then, um, then I'm going to take part of the tumor out, but not all of it. And then we're going to look again with the uh, fluorescent uh, endoscope. And um, so, oh, I see. Yeah, I was going to pull it out. I was like, oh, it'll be cooler if I put the uh, fluorescence in. So um, it's all about video making. Um, so I'll let me speed this up a little bit because it's all about the margins. Um, and here, I think it was very interesting because uh, you got to be... Um, because I, I know that there's still more tumor left because I, I, I have that lateral cyst out there. There's a, um, but I know that there's still tumor right there in the middle. So, and I confirmed that with the um, uh, near infrared. So now let me go back and um, work on that. Uh, I don't usually use the fluorescent uh, to operate. I use just standard white light, even in case like this. Okay, so now peeling it off the um, PCA, there's the third ventricle. So now I know I'm getting more and more out, but pay attention to that left hypothalamus um, because that was where that cyst kind of intersected with the mass. And so um, it just kind of tore off there. And there's choroid plexus. Choroid plexus holds on to ICG. Um, and um, it, you'll, you'll see that in a minute, but take a look at this wall right here. And um, now I'm gonna take a look with the camera and we got, definite strong fluorescence here. And then we'll see right up there in the choroid plexus, there's some fluorescence as well, which I, I've published on as well as just some of the nonspecific. There's that cyst out left. So here, I wasn't planning to resect that um, because, but I will biopsy it. And then this comes back as craniopharyngioma. So I probably left tumor right here. And I think in retrospect, you know, you know, because um, it's a technique that's still in evolution and just barely maybe some hand enhancement. And this is about four years ago now. So I'm still following. Nothing's really changed. But um, that's, I think, the power of fluorescence. Um, it is much more visible um, with that than, uh, um, than uh, just with your naked eye. And so I think that's where we're going to start to make huge improvements. And um, so I think this is a technique that um, I want to popularize or I want to kind of get out there more. But one of the challenges is I'm using a drug that I have no company. There's no VC money. There's no, uh, it's a generic. Uh, how do you get anybody to fund a randomized control trial? Somebody asked a question about what about data? What about, you know, you have a, Walt Stumer has a RCT published in Lancet Oncology with, you know, 200 randomized patients on each arm. Well, who's going to pay for that? I don't. I I can't sponsor a study with all of the, uh, a you know SAE boards and you know data monitoring board. I mean, like uh, how how is that going to happen? Um, 
And um, even so, I approached the generic co- one of the companies that distributes it. We I pitched an idea for them to expand their indications, go to the FDA, this that. But I mean, at the end of the day, it's like way too much money because there's no pathway to repurpose an old drug. Um, the FDA has a very good system for new drugs, but repurposing an old drug um, is actually not that straightforward, um, and it still can be just as expensive. Um, uh, as, uh, as a new drug, especially at the doses we're using. So that's why there, I have a lot of interest in lowering the dose now. And uh, we're try- I'm trying to get a sponsor for the study. I'm tired of like spending my own money on this, like my philanthropy money on this. I need somebody to pay for this. So. Yeah, no, I mean, I've seen that happen a lot of times with researchers as well for, for, for uh, glioblastoma too, when you try to look for... Um, you know, products or drugs that are already out there, or even, um, you know, more of a kind of a holistic approach with some of the holistic medication that's already out there. It's even if you find that it works in the lab, it's so hard then to kind of get that company to then reinvest in, in a, a trial or something like that for, for that drug that's already out there. Even though the line to um, patients is much straighter because you already have it kind of to go. But um, so with that, with the case you're showing, though, could you with the endoscope, can you actually see Do you have to have the endoscope through the actual cellar opening to see that or could because of the, the, the tissue penetration, could you have the endoscope far like outside the bone and kind of just span the entire supercellar area without actually having to see it directly with the scope and pick up that there's some fluorescence there? Um, so design child engineering challenges a four millimeter scope. Um, one, you have to bring, you have to get that excitation light powerful enough to excite that fluorophore or, or even just to see, I mean, um, think about, um, so I do all my microvascular decompressions. I've done, you know, close almost a thousand, uh, not quite, quite 600 maybe, but I do a lot of them through with an endoscope, but I use a 2.7 millimeter outer diameter endoscope. So it's a tiny endoscope. When you put that camera on there, you can barely fill the, the, the screen. Um, so there's not enough light coming back even to see um, or, or fill that entire camera. Contrast that with a four millimeter, which can virtually fill the whole thing. Can contrast that with a thoracoscope uh, or, a, or, you know, what they, or a laparoscope, which is a 10 millimeter outer diameter. They have plenty of light. Um, so you have to get light down and light back. And um, you have to deliver enough light to excite very small amounts of fluorophore. Now, I, what I've done, for example, is I've taken this meningioma, I've done the five mg per kilo um, injection the day before, and then I just give, have the anesthesiologist give um, five milligrams at the time of um, uh, just while we're watching, because I want to see kind of the venous drainage into that sagittal sinus. That was fascinating because, boom, all of a sudden, all I could see at a one at least one order of magnitude brighter was the vasculature. I couldn't see any of my tumor anymore because um, the, uh, the little amount of ICG, only that five milligrams in the vasculature was so much brighter than like that 180 milligrams I had given, you know, or you know, five times 70, whatever, 350 milligrams I had given um, the day before. So it's small amounts of fluorophore that is actually at the, at the tissue. So you need really sensitive um, systems to detect it. So I guess in answer to your question, that endoscope is pretty close to target. So, so I don't think I can see it with a microscope. You could, see, you could penetrate through the dura and through brain to possibly see yeah. deeper. You think it's possible to penetrate through bone to see uh, you know, tumor that may be around the corner of a skull-based surgery where you're wondering if you should expand your opening further uh, and whether it'd be worth it. I can see through a mouse skull, but I don't, I can't, I can't, I can't see through. I definitely have not see, been able to see through a, a, a human skull, but mouse skull is actually pretty good. Um, so. Great. Yeah. No, phenomenal work. And uh, any other comments from the panelists? Congratulations, man. I think it's, it's great work. Yeah, I think. Thank you. Oh, this it's very exciting. And uh, yeah, I think that the frustration is the, the funding and, and completing it, but you know. <laughs> yeah. I think you have your cohort of, uh, of uh, sub PIs here if you, if you need yep. them. So uh, <laughs> just let us yeah. know when you're ready to start. <laughs> That's right. 
Uh, but thanks again, uh, and thank you to Dr. Lee and all our panelists for, for your time tonight. It was a phenomenal talk. Uh, please, everybody, stay safe, and, and we'll see you back here again next week uh, for Dr. Stoop.